Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I'm Dr. Donnie Whitsitt. I'm a clinical associate professor here at the School of Social Work. Welcome. I'm glad you came. Uh, really, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about a subject that I think is very important and that really doesn't get enough press. So, um, uh, can you get them to be quiet? <laughs> Thanks. I'd like to begin, uh, first of all, by telling you that one of the reasons I wanted to do this today is because uh, education really is probably our most powerful weapon against these very destructive groups. The more we know about them, uh, the more people can really protect themselves and their loved ones from uh, getting into these groups. So I, I'd like to begin with a little vignette that gives you a real flavor for uh, how people can be attracted to groups and what happens. This is the case of Catherine, who was a 21-year-old woman raised in an upper-middle-class Jewish family. Like many young adults, Catherine was idealistic, compassionate, and ready to do great things in her life. Her decision to go to college in New York was a first step in that direction. During orientation week, Catherine was walking around campus when she was approached by a young man to whom she was instantly attracted. They began a conversation, and soon she suggested that he suggested that she attend a weekend retreat in the mountains with him and some of his friends. It was a retreat to discuss eradicating world hunger. Catherine was immediately intrigued with this idea as it appealed to her sense of social justice. So the following weekend, she boarded a bus with other people her age. She told her parents that she, what she was doing, and she said she would call them from the camp. However, there was no reception at the camp for her to use her cell phone, nor were there any landlines, email, or other means of communication. In fact, all communication was cut off. When Catherine's parents didn't hear from her for several days, they became very concerned. When she finally did call a few days later, she sounded a bit strange, somewhat euphoric, and told her parents she had decided to do some humanitarian work with this group and to postpone going to college. Only several weeks later did Catherine learn that the group to whom she now felt committed and for whom she had given up her individual goals were, was the Unification Church, also known as the Moonies. However, by the time the real leadership of the group was revealed to her, she was firmly entrenched in its structure and very attached to her new group of friends, sincerely believing in their mission to save the world. How selfish it would be for her, she felt, to pursue her own individual goals when this group's, group's goals and vision were so much more important. The rest is a typical story of parents frantically trying to extricate their child from a totalistic environment and to undo the mind control techniques to which Catherine had been subjected. Severely restricted from communicating with her in any way, and then only when another group member was present, Catherine had come to believe that her parents were evil and that it was dangerous to talk to them because Satan was talking through them, using them as a conduit to ensnare her back into the world of sin. This story ends happily, unlike many others. Catherine's parents sought the advice of professional exit counselors who were able to strategize with them and eventually get her out of the group. Catherine is a healthy 26-year-old now who has channeled her values and compassion into more traditional avenues. She became a social worker. OK. So this is a very typical story. It really is. And it actually is mostly true. OK. So what is a cult? Well, this is a definition developed uh, by the International Cultic Studies Association, which used to be known as the American Family Foundation a group or movement exhibiting an excessive dedication to some person, idea, or thing 
and employing unethical manipulative techniques of persuasion and control designed to advance the goals of the group's leaders, not the members, the group's leaders to the detriment of the group's members, their families, and or the community. There are many different types of what we call cult, and the word cult has become very controversial. I'm going to use uh, other words like high demand group, unsafe group, totalistic group. These are some of the other words that we now use, uh, but or I'll use the word cult. Anyway, there are lots of different types because many times people always think only about Bible-based groups, but in fact there are therapy groups, there are political groups, uh, there are white supremacy groups, new age groups, UFO groups, satanic groups, and the, the list goes on. There's also, notice this, there are one-on-one -on -one family groups, uh, like partners often can have cultic relationships. The most common ones today, actually, that we see are the hybrids. There's Eastern philosophy mixed in with New Age and some psychology thrown in as well. But the ones that I think you guys are probably most concerned about uh, because I think they're the ones that operate mostly on college campuses are Eastern-based groups and Bible-based groups. So I'm always asked, why do people join cults? Okay? What's important to know is that no one joins a cult. They are recruited, recruited heavily. And also, no one joins a cult. They join groups. They join groups that they feel will enhance them in some way, such as a Bible-based group or a psychotherapy group or a Tai Chi group. They feel that it's going to uh, increase their growth in some way, uh, but that doesn't happen. If somebody came up to you and said, you know, I, have, I belong to this cult, and we'd really like you to join us, and all you have to do is give us your money and give us all your time, and uh, never talk to your parents again, well, nobody <laughs> is going to get into a group like that, right? So it, it's very subtle. Uh, there is no truth in advertising, and people really don't know what they're getting into. Cult experts believe, actually, that everyone at some point in their life is vulnerable to cult indoctrination. These times are when people are either in transition or when they're in a crisis. And of course, you know, life does throw us those um, curves. Uh, because what happens is people are very vulnerable at those particular times when you're going through a transition or a crisis. We're looking for someone bigger and stronger than us, perhaps, to lean on, somebody to give us direction, tell us what to do, right? Uh, and this vulnerability then interacts with subtle but very highly persuasive and powerful techniques of mind control. Now, young adults are particularly vulnerable because they are going through a transition, and that's why one of the reasons we thought this would be useful and interesting for, for you. Because of the developmental period that young adults are going through at that time, uh, they are very vulnerable. And these developmental issues include they're individuating from the family. Now, often people think that people, people who get into cults are people who are not close to their family. That turns out to be very untrue, and in fact, it's often the opposite that it's people who are connected into their family and don't want to really leave, but it is a developmental emancipation step. So uh, they want to find a new family that will substitute. Okay, so I want to bust that myth here for the moment. Um, oops. There's also people are looking for uh, a group to belong to. They're between commitments. They're searching for direction. And college students are very open to new ideas. 
they're curious, they're idealistic, and this makes them very vulnerable. In addition, they're going through what I call existential angst, the crisis of meaning, the crisis of identity. Who am I? You know, these are questions we all have to struggle with. Who am I? Why am I here on Earth? Uh, what is the meaning of life? All of those things. Well, what's so nice is that the cult comes along and says, well, we know why you're here, and we will tell you what your mission in life is, and we know the meaning of life. Okay. Now, that's enormously relieving to anyone that is struggling with those issues, and everybody does. Everybody does at some point in their life. Uh, so th there actually has been a study of someone who, uh, of going into the Unification Church, and they discovered that a few weeks after people had been indoctrinated into the group, their levels of anxiety went down. Well, that seems like, you know, it might be a good thing, but in fact it really isn't, because anxiety goes along with these, you know, these ex existential struggles, and we all have to do it. So what happens then is when someone comes out of a cult, they have to revisit these issues and struggle uh, with them like we all do. Is that clear? Good. Okay. So what is mind control? Well, a psychologist named Robert J. Lifton did a landmark study uh, in the early 60s, I think it was, of the brainwashing techniques of the POWs captured by the Chinese. Uh, Lifton identified eight dynamics of what he called the totalistic environment. And in other words, why were the POWs, why did they succumb to the propaganda that, was, uh, that they experienced in Korea? Yeah, but how can I do this? Hello? All right, I'll see what I can do. Should I keep this quiet? Or what? No, I just keep making that. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You need three hands, you know. I need the cult of the octopus. It's really what I need here. Okay, so Robert J. Lifton developed uh, these eight criteria. Oh, whoops. These eight criteria. And these criteria or characteristics have become the yardstick, if you will, against which we hold a group and determine whether or not we would consider it a destructive cult. Now, as I go through some of these, you're going to recognize characteristics in all the groups that you belong to because every group has some of these characteristics because they are group dynamics. Okay? The problem is in a cult, um, they have all of them and they have them to a very extreme degree. So I'm not, I really don't want to go th through all of them because of time. Uh, in your handout, there is on the first page, I believe, these characteristics are identified and described. And also, in the second and third pages, you have this handout. This was developed by the ICSA Foundation that I mentioned, and they elaborate the characteristics that Lifton described. I would like to just go through a few of them because um, these, I think, are some of the most important. The group, in the group, questioning, doubt, and dissent are discouraged or even punished. Mind-altering practices such as meditation, chanting, speaking in tongues, and debilitating routines are used in excess and serve to suppress doubts about the group and its leader. The leadership dictates, sometimes in great detail, how members should think, act, and feel they have to get permission to date, to change jobs, to marry, to have children. Um, and every time you have to ask permission for everything you do, 
you are reduced to a childlike position, right? The leader is not accountable to any authority. The group teaches or implies that its supposedly exalted end justifies whatever means it deems necessary. So this is uh, an, the end justifies the means mentality. And in fact, many of the groups have policies that sanction uh, illegal activities and unethical activities. For example, there's one group that has a department called, uh, or a policy called Heavenly Deception. Nice title. Um, another one called Transcendental Trickery. Sounds nice. And then there's another one called the Dirty Tricks Department. Now, you may ask how we know these things. Uh, these come from people, this information comes a lot from people who have left the groups and uh, had bad experiences. And so they tell us, and we also get internal memos that confirm what I, the information I'm giving you here. The leadership induces feelings of shame and or guilt in order to influence or control their members. Uh, subservience to the leader or group requires that members cut ties with families and friends and radically alter their personal goals and activities. You know, to the degree that anyone is attached to their parents or anyone outside the group, to that degree, the attachment to the leader and the group is diminished. And in fact, I'm going to read you. I wanted to read you uh, a quote. This is from the Rajneesh Chronicles. The, books, the book is over there. And by the way, I brought some books that you can uh, look at today. Uh, I didn't bring my whole library, but these are some of them. So this is a quote from Rajneesh. All your energy is needed for your personal growth or enlightenment. So you should not share your energy with your partner or even a child. It should be used for yourself. And in uh, many of the Eastern groups, by the way, they send children off to India at the age of five, which uh, disrupts the attachment, as you can imagine. I do, I do want to mention just a few other things here. One is, uh, oops, hello, one is loading the language, this one, loading the language. All groups have jargon. I mean, we in the mental health profession use the DSM and uh, we talk to each other about disorders and that's jargon also. But in the, in cults, what they do is they have what, what we call thought terminating cliches. What that means is they have ways of condensing problems into very small pieces of information so that it cuts off all discussion. For example, I'll give you one of my favorite examples, also happens to be from the Unification Church, um, <clears throat> which is that they have two categories of problems. One is called a Cain and Abel problem, and the other is called a Chapter 2 problem. Uh, a Cain and Abel problem is a problem that a person has either with their subordinate or with someone higher than them. So if you have a problem with your boss uh, or one of your employees, they say, well, this is just a, this is a, uh, a Cain and Abel problem, and that's it. Nobody discusses it. If you have a problem with your partner or spouse, oh, well, that's just a chapter two problem, and no one discusses it. Okay, so it simply cuts off all exploration of uh, human interaction, actually. As I mentioned, every group has cultic ca characteristics, so don't get nervous. If you see some of your, um, the, your group's characteristics here. Remember, 
It isn't the beliefs, it is the practices. In other words, we don't really care whether, like as in the heaven ga Heaven's Gate cult, people believed with Marshall Applewhite that they had to give up their physical bodies so that they could go on the Hale-Bopp comet and get on the spaceship that was hiding behind it where Jesus was. You know, we really don't care that that's what people believe. And there are some very bizarre beliefs. There, there's one major group that believes we came from another planet and things like that. Fine. You know, maybe we did. I really don't know. But uh, the point is, it's the way that these beliefs are carried out and perpetrated on people. Now, there are two tiers of cult involvement. The first tier is called indoctrination, and the second tier is the maintenance tier. The first tier, indoctrination, is the, we call it the love bombing phase. People are made to feel loved. They're made to feel accepted. They feel wonderful. They finally got the family that they've always wanted. Uh, and then once they're pretty much indoctrinated and firmly entrenched like Catherine, then uh, the three Ds come in. We call this the three Ds, dread, dependency, and debilitation. Uh, due to time, because I'm noticing the time, don't have too much time to go into these very much. But uh, what's important is there's a real fear of outsiders. And uh, when people come out of cults, they're so afraid of the consequences of leaving that a client of mine who had left the 12 tribes sat on his bed for a week with his daughter and waited to die. And people really believe that the cult leader can hear their thoughts and know what they're thinking and know where they are as well. Uh, dependency, this is where there are techniques that cause people to be regressed to an earlier level of development. The, some of the techniques are sitting, quote, at the feet of the master. Kind of like that for classrooms. You know, I'll have my students come in, Mandy, come in and sit at my feet. You know, but you know, that, that makes you feel, uh, the, the members feel very childlike. In some groups, the leader is called a true father, true mother. They're referred to as father. In the Branch Davidian group, you know, the Waco fiasco, uh, when the children were asked who their father was, they all said David Koresh was, when in fact, many of them had biological fathers living nearby. In terms of debilitation, People are kept in a very weakened, debilitated state. Sleep deprivation is very common. Sometimes uh, there will be long Bible studies going on through the night, and then people have to get up in the morning and go to work. I had a client who was put on a celery and water diet until she finally collapsed after three months. And people's days are overstructured, so there's lots of activities, homework. What that does is you don't have time. To, I know you feel like your day is like that. I certainly feel like mine is often too. But there's no time to think. There's no time to question. You know, there's no time to doubt anything, and that's the whole point. Okay. Um, I just wanted to. How am I doing on time? I'm okay? I did want to mention scripture twisting because I do think that the Bible-based groups are probably the most common on campuses. Um, what, they, what the Bible-based groups do is they twist the scriptures. So they take verses out of context and nobody goes to check. They'll, the second one is really important, the Bible hook. A pastor, somebody that people trust, or a minister or a rabbi, will say, well, the Bible says such and such, and nobody checks, you know. Um, they ignore the context. They will pull out certain verses to build their uh, case that su supposedly supports the rhetoric of a particular group. 
Um, and they use the obvious fallacy, which is uh, a minister will say, well, you know, it's obvious that any intelligent person can see. Well, you really don't want to question then because that means that you're not particularly uh, an intelligent person. Uh, so the point is, and I really uh, would ask everybody, if, you know, if you think you're, gonna, you're getting into a group like this, question, go to the Bible, or ask another minister or another clergy if that, in fact, is so, you know, and make your own decision. Okay, so now we get to what parents can do. Well, what you don't want to do is panic. It's very important to stay calm. If you think your child is getting into a destructive cult, don't panic, don't um, stay calm, and don't get hysterical, which is what most parents do, okay? Educate yourself as much as you can about the group. Now, this is pretty easy to do today on the Internet. And what's really nice is that a lot of people who have left destructive groups, they have their own website. There's one called Silent Lambs. Uh, there's another called MovingOn.com. Uh, these are for a particular groups and people post, and it's, and it's also a nice support group for people who have left. So educate yourselves. Hear the positive and hear the negative. And find out everything you can, because what you want to do is you want to question. You, you want to stimulate the questioning of your child. You want to help the person get back their ability to evaluate and critically assess. Okay, so, and you can't do that if you don't know what the group is all about. So you can ask things like, um, well, what, is, what, is, what do they mean by this? You know, what do they mean by a chapter two problem? What, is, what do they mean by blah, blah, blah? Why do you dress a certain way? Why do you have to ask permission to date someone or to come home to see me? You know, so you want to, I mean, you, you don't want to badger them. That's the last thing you want to do. But you want to make sure, you want to start stimulating. Now, one of the things that happens is you may get a lot of resistance at first. Don't worry about that. Because when the, the child starts to have doubts, they'll remember that. And they'll come back to you also if you keep lines of communication open. This last one. Is that... Make sense? So you, you want to ask, ask questions rather than give advice. Very important. Also, in your packet, there's a whole handout of what parents can do. And this comes from the literature, from uh, people who have been working in this area for three decades. Okay. For the student, you want, if you're invited to a special lecture or a special dinner, especially if it's up in the mountains, you know, or a retreat. You want to know who the sponsor is. Who is the leader? Can you maintain communication with your family, with your friends? Or do you have to give everybody up? Are the values of the group congruent with your values? If they're very different, you really want to consider that. It's not that you don't want to be open to new ideas, but you really want to consider what that is, what that's about. Can you question? If you question the leader or the other members of the group and they make you feel bad, they, they shame you in some way, like they say things like, well, you're not quite ready, you know? You're not quite, when you're really enlightened, you'll understand this. Or, when you reach nirvana, you know, something along those lines, if you are made to feel ashamed, humiliated, bad in any way, that is not the group for you, okay? It's ve that's very important. In, in education, we make sure, we try very hard when a student asks a question, that they're not shamed, because who's going to ask the, the next question then? No one. Can you have outside friends, or do you have to give up? your friends, you know. Um, they'll say things like, um, 
people, you know, the, out, the people on the outside don't quite understand, and it's going to inhibit your growth if you maintain contact with them. So maybe you should just have friends with us. Can you hear? It's very subtle. You know, it's very subtle, but it's very powerful. Can you leave the group? Can you leave the group without feeling like a failure? That's very important. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to go through these, but I just want to show this to you. These are some of the harmful effects that we've noticed in groups. And I've given you also um, a list of resources that you can continue to read or contact uh, people that, organizations that I've listed. There's something called the post-cult syndrome, which is very similar to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but it has a particular form. We have noticed psychiatric disturbances in people who have left or been exit counseled out. They have nightmares, intrusive thoughts, lots of anxiety, fear of retaliation, depression, and lots of guilt, guilt about what they had to do in the group, and also a lot of shame about having been attracted to the group in the first place. Um, there's also the typical trauma response, which is the dialectic of trauma, uh, psychic numbing, vacillating with a rage reaction. We see this in all PTSD survivors. And these are some of the modalities that we, that we use for treatment. Before exit counseling, we counsel the family. And then we, we, it's kind of like doing an intervention, really. Uh, then we do exit counseling. We don't do deprogramming. Deprogramming was where people were illegally kidnapped off the street. That's not done anymore. So anyway, it's called the exit counseling. And individual counseling, family psychoeducation. Once the person comes out, the family needs some education about what happened to the member in the group and how to help them through the recovery period. And some people like to go into support groups. So I'd like to end then with a quote from Jeannie Mills, who was a former member of the People's Temple, you know, the Jonestown group. She wrote, and shortly after she wrote this, she disappeared under very mysterious circumstances. When you meet the friendliest people you have ever known, who introduce you to the most loving group of people you've ever encountered, and you find the leader to be the most inspired and caring and compassionate person you've ever met, and then you learn that the cause of the group is something you never dared hope could be accomplished, and all of this sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Don't give up your hopes and dreams to follow a rainbow. So I'll take questions, comments. Thomas. Well, you know, let me tell you, it's very, very hard to do research in this field. But um, anecdotally, we do see as I mentioned, that people almost invariably, almost 100% people are going through a transition in their life or a crisis. So that's number one. Now, there was a study done several years ago in New York at the New York Cult Clinic, which is probably the largest cult clinic in, in the country, probably the world. And they did find that uh, the kids that went in were, well, of course, it was at part of Jewish family service, so they were mostly Jewish, obviously. But they came from families that had very high ideals and were very idealistic. And the children felt a real uh, commitment to, you know, to idealism. And there was also quite a bit of, of pressure on them. So that's one study. Um, mostly it's 
from, mostly it's anecdotal. There isn't a lot of empirical research at this point. Yeah. Are there uh, known folks here on campus, on the fringe of campus, and what can you do about it if you have any? Uh, this, you asked me this too. Jan is from uh, the Daily Trojan. She asked me the same question last night, so I'm prepared with the answer. Thank you, Jan. Uh, the, the answer is I don't know for sure. I strongly suspect that there are. Uh, I, I know for sure that there was a group that was kicked off campus and uh, took up residence across the street at the shrine. That I know. Uh, what can we do about it? There, there is a, um, the Department of Religious Studies, and Rabbi Lemley is in charge of that. Now, she has, there are certain criteria, there are certain restrictions that any group that's in the middle of campus, you know, that sets up a little table, they have to meet these requirements, and they, there are things they cannot do. As long as they stay within those boundaries, there's nothing apparently the university can do. But what's really important to know, and this is what I said to Jana last night, is campuses, universities are gateways into these groups. And so that's why I say if people are invited to a lecture, to a special lecture, know who's, re who's sponsoring it. If you're invited to a special dinner, know, know who's providing the food. You know, there's not, no such thing as a free lunch, as somebody once said. You really, so that's why I want to educate people because unfortunately there's very little we can do as long as the groups maintain um, what they're supposed to do here on campus. However, I will tell you, I have picked up people's literature uh, from tables. There was a group that was proselytizing outside the bookstore. I went back into the bookstore and told them, and they were removed. So if you see anything, please do that. Yeah. Catherine? Yeah. Yes. You would be surprised. It, ta it happens very quickly. It's, it almost, it has been likened to a trans state. Uh, there's a book called Snapping also, which describes this. You see a personality change. And often the person will seem very euphoric. Now, I've had clients who have been actually in manic states and had to be hospitalized after a weekend. It, happen, it can happen very quickly. It can happen very quickly because the, the techniques are very powerful and there's a lot of peer pressure. Um, it, it's just, it does. Uh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Thanks for asking, too. This one? Okay, good. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, these are some of the, and that's a short list. Marlene? <laughs> yes, I've thought about it myself. It's very lucrative. <laughs> well, first, first, you pretty much have to have either a personality disorder. <laughs> or, or you may be, have to be mentally ill. So the profile of cult leaders is usually someone who has narcissistic personality disorder, usually coupled with antisocial personality disorder, which I believe Kernberg calls malignant narcissism, and, uh, or paranoid and or paranoid personality disorder. Uh, David Koresh was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, Many cult leaders do have schizophrenia. And uh, you know what happens is they have these visions and these hallucinations, but they're seen as the gospel because they are already, they've already set themselves up as an, authority, as an authority in some way. So if you think about pastors or clergy, the people respect them, or teachers, teachers, psychotherapists, 
There are psychotherapy cults, believe me. Yeah, so does that help you? I don't know if you're, if you're going to qualify, Marlene. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I can't think of any. Now, actually what happens, though, is there's sort of an interaction between the cult leader and the members. So the leader provides the needs for the member, and the, then the, the members, because they idealize the cult leader and look up to him as this omnipotent object, you know, that actually increases his own narcissism. So in my uh, conceptualization, there's like a bidirectional um, situation that occurs, really. And um, it's, it's a projective identification situation, if anybody knows what I mean by that. Yeah, let me just take one back there. I don't know of any. This, that's why you're here, and that's what I'm doing, I guess. You know, actually, Thomas, there are studies that show that the, the age group, 18 to 24, is the most prevalent. That's when most people go into cults. Now, I'm not sure that figure still is accurate because many groups are now infiltrating businesses. And uh, they're, they're saying, you know, they're having these workshops on excellence and how to increase your productivity and all of that. So businesses are now very uh, vulnerable, but college students, I mean, this is why I'm doing this. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Sure. Claire. I would love to. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, now that's very interesting. Maybe you can tell me who did that, and maybe we can do something. I don't know. Really? You sure it wasn't a, an alcohol cult? <laughs> <laughs> because the reason I say that is because one of the techniques is forcing people to listen to long lectures or listen to tapes or whatever without breaks, you know, and you get, and because they don't, you know, she said to you, don't disturb me. Okay, well, imagine if she went away for a weekend, you know, and you couldn't disturb her. So there's no, you know, it's a closed system. There's no, uh, nothing coming in to the system to counter. Positive brainwashing. Well, um, that's wonderful. That's great. That's great. Well, maybe I can find out who's doing that. You know, well, the problem is it's a little bit different with alcoholism. Everybody agrees alcoholism and drugs are bad. Not everybody agrees that these groups are bad. And in fact, uh, the First Amendment of free speech protects them a lot. And this is why when you ask, is there anything we can do? I mean, Germany did it. They kicked certain groups out. The Netherlands won't let certain groups come in. America will not do it because I know, I know. I, I agree. It's a terrible situation. I get very frustrated. It's like wake up, you know. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right. And you sound pretty knowledgeable, too. Um, one of the things we've noted, which you very nicely said, is that 
no matter whether it's a, a, a Bible-based group, an Eastern-based group, an economic group, whatever the group it is, is, there's remarkable similarities. And so when people are in support groups, it's very powerful and healing to hear that other people have had these experiences. That is very powerful. The one thing that we do do, the exit counselors are people who have been in the group and have left. So they can speak the language. You know, it's kind of like I probably wouldn't talk to somebody from a Bible-based group because I'm not that familiar with the Bible. I, the person needs to talk the same language, the same rhetoric, the jargon. Okay, so the exit counselor is specific, but, and I do therapy, counseling after. I don't do exit counseling, but I might work with an exit counselor, you know, and I uh, might put somebody in a support group so they can get the support of other people who have had that experience. Does that answer your question? Now, if I were a cult leader, I would have answered that differently, actually. Thank you for your attention.